Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. This is the day that God has purpose to speak to you. You are not here by accident, but by divine appointment. For if God declared that because of sin, man is separated from God, but that God has made the way of reconciliation to himself, with his only begotten Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus said of himself, he is the way, the truth, the life. Amen. No man coming to the Father but by Jesus. Amen. But for those who will say, Lord, save me, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible said you shall be saved. Amen. The Holy Spirit then comes in to indwell the believer and to give us help as we journey through the remainder of the life that we have on this side of time. But when we enter in into eternity, the Lord has prepared a place for us to receive us, a building of God not made by hand, but eternal in the heavens. And so there is something to look forward to here and there. But for those who never accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Word of God is clear and requires you to be warned that failure to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior results in you being lost in sin. When you die in this life physically, you then enter into the presence of God to be judged of your sin. You will be found guilty and the punishment for that guilt, that guilty verdict is then eternal separation from God, a place of agony, anguish, torment, lake of fire forever. But heaven can be yours today. It is your decision. At the conclusion of the word of God may increase, we will then give opportunity for you to then come and make public your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, having been led of the Holy Spirit, becoming a candidate for baptism. The water baptism symbolizes that you have died to the old man and been raised anew in Christ. We will also give opportunity that if you are saved but not yet planted in a church home, if you are led of the Spirit of God, then unite with these fellowship, of this fellowship of believers, that then we will give you the opportunity to come by letter or Christian experience. But we pray today that someone will come unto Jesus while there is yet time. Let the church say amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, thanking you for who you are. You are God. And the greatness of who you are that makes it possible for us to enter into your holy presence. We do so reverently and humbly, asking you to forgive us of our sin, for we confess and repent of our sin, and that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Speak, Lord, to us. Give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive your word. And after having heard it and received it, that we will then allow it to be applied to our lives that it will produce fruit that you are pleased with, that we be acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer today. In your Son, our Savior Christ Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen. amen. Acts chapter 17, beginning, and I'll read verse 29, uh, but we will cover uh, the entirety of the text. Verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Let the church say, Amen. The Godhead. Continue to look at what the scripture has to say concerning who God is, his character, his essence, what he does. And in so doing to then understand what God would then require of us as those who follow him. Amen. Today we look at Acts chapter 17, verse 29, the Godhead. The Godhead simply means, as it is applied here, to the divinity of God. The divinity of God, the deity of God or the Godness of God. It is critical because the Bible tells us when we saw in Genesis chapter 1, the first verse of the Bible, it said that 
God in the beginning made heaven and the earth. Mm -hmm. And so Elohim was the word that was used to tell us about that creativeness of God. Elohim meant the plurality of God, the oneness of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The oneness, the wholeness, the completeness, the unity of what we call the Godhead. Mm -hmm. uh, one God manifests in three persons, mm -hmm. not three gods. One God manifests as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now in the book of 1 John chapter 5, we are being given clarity even further because 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 says that there are three that bear a record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and we saw that the Word refers to Jesus Christ. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So then there are many people who start to say, well, the, the word Trinity is not found in the scripture. And they are correct to say that. However, the triuneness of that oneness of God is found throughout scripture. Well, today, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 is the text uh, beginning in uh, chapter 17, verse 17 tells us that therefore disputed he uh, let me start at verse 16 now while Paul waiting for them at, at, at Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy his traveling companions uh, he has gone on and uh, he's now at Athens uh, now that Paul waiting for them at Athens his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry uh, what is idolatry? Simply anything that worships as God, anything other than God. So idolatry has a, a wide spectrum of things. Because if God is not first and only first in your life, then technically you are an idolater. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, idolatry in our contemporary society takes the form of there are some people who call themselves atheists. They say they don't believe in God. Well, that's idolatry. And then there are agnostics. There are people who say, well, you can't really or show no God because he's not tangible that you can measure him. And so then again, they allow that to then prevent them from accepting what the word of God has said about how God has revealed himself to humanity. And so then idolatry takes uh, many forms. But here, the scripture says Paul is in Athens. And those of you who have studied uh, history know that uh, the Greeks were well known for their uh, religiousness and their politicalness, their intellect, and their emphasis on education. And so, by themselves, those things are not necessarily bad, but anything without God don't wind up being bad. Amen. So see, politics ain't bad, but when you get politicians who don't have God in you, know, that's when you get bad. The education is bad, but when you try to educate folk and then don't tell them what thus said the Lord, that's when the bad things start to happen. Even those who are in academia, those who are supposed to be intellectually enlightened, yeah. can wind up doing things that are contrary to common sense. Because it does take a little bit of common sense to know that uh, this thing about marriage equality, yeah. about uh, men want to be with men, yeah. and women want to be with women. They want to get a marriage license, and, and it don't take but a little common sense to realize something wrong with that. But if all the men line up over here and hook up, and all the women line up over there and hook up, ain't going to be long before ain't nobody left.
idolatry. Because even intellectual people, people who have matriculated to the universities, have, have become prey to thoughts that are not consistent with the word of God. You want to have a sound man? Get in God's word. You want to know what you ought to do in a situation? Get in God's word, God says. Paul sees a city holy, given to idolatry. Now look what he did. Therefore, disputing he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Paul speaks not only in the synagogue, in the church, but he also speaks in the marketplace. That means that when he went out into the streets, the same word he was telling folk that came to church, but the same word he was telling folk out in the street. And there ought to be some consistency about us. We ought not have a different kind of talk when we out there than we have in here.
because at its core, it tells them that they cannot do anything about their condition themselves. They need some help. He says, Thou bringest strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So now they, they were actually a little bit curious. Although they didn't understand it, they were curious about the new thing that Paul was preaching, which is totally different from the idolatry that they followed. Now, in, in, in history in school, you know, they, they tell you about the Greek and the Roman mythology. And all of the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. And every, every god had some kind of power or characteristic about it. And so they, they had a lot of little G gods that, that they used to then try to explain why this happened and why that happened. But look at what the Bible says. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too what? Superstitious. Superstitious. So that for them, life was about trying to maneuver around their superstitions. So you, you met folk, haven't you? Who are superstitious folk? You know, if they're walking down the sidewalk with somebody, and there's a column in the middle of the sidewalk. And they say, you can't what? You can't spit the pole. <laughs> Why you can't spit the pole? <laughs> that man looks. All right. They say you're not supposed to walk under a ladder. Why? That's bad luck. What, what, are, what are some of the other superstitions? Well, we don't even have time today to get into all of the superstitions of why folks hang a horseshoes over the door. Or got a rabbit foot in their pocket. That's superstition. Because it may be for them good luck, but it sure ain't good for that rabbit. God 
singular. Do you see that? Yeah. He talking to some intellectual folk. They got a whole lot of little G God. The first word that he said, he said, you have a statue to the only unknown God, and you don't really know who it is that you're talking about. Let me tell you who he is. God Almighty. Singular. What God? God has made the world and all things therein. Now, he attaches God, singular, with being creator. He said, this God made everything in the heavens and in the earth. And he is the Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temples made with man. Not only does he establish that God singular is creator, but then he also establishes that God is supreme because he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And then he talks about the sovereignty of God because he tells him, and God, this God, cannot be served by the creation of humanity. Do you see that? He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Because they're temples for those Greeks, those Athenians. They're temples, not only did they worship at the temples, but they worship the temple. And they worship the statue in the temple. But here again, the statue that they created was then limited by their creativity. Yeah. And so Paul drives the point, verse 25, neither is God worshipped with men's hands as though, look at this church, not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed what? Yeah. Anything. Yeah. This speaks then to the self-sufficiency of God. God don't need nothing in order to exist.
before appointed. Now I had to stick a pin in that because that tells me ain't nothing taking God by surprise. And I told you earlier about these folks who talk about men out there marrying men and women out there marrying women. That don't take God by surprise because when you think back and you look back over history, this ain't the first time that man. Graven image of God. 
images to be made of himself. Go back and read the commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Because man can only make an image of something in his Of God's knowledge. Yeah. That means he's infinite. Yeah. Right. When God said, let there be, watch this, y'all. God said, let there be. Yeah. And the Bible said, and it occurred. Grass began to grow. Yeah. Just because God said, let there be. Yeah. Apple tree began to grow. Yeah. Just because God said, let there be. Yeah. Orange and peach and grapefruit trees yeah. appear.
some more art. And others said, we will hear thee again in this matter. In other words, they told us, just, just hush up. And, and we might talk to you again later about this. How did Paul depart from a monk? Remember Jesus said this, now when you go and you tell somebody about the gospel and they reject you, don't stand in an hour with them no more. Shake the dust off of your Believe too. 